Well, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. James Norman uh, of the Norman Parathyroid Center in Tampa, Florida. Uh, Dr. Norman is credited with developing uh, the modern approach to parathyroid surgery and is considered the father of minimally invasive uh, parathyroid surgery. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons as well as a fellow of the American College of uh, Endocrinology. He's the director of the Parathyroid Center at Tampa General Hospital. Dr. Norman joined the staff at USF in 1991 with an emphasis on endocrine surgery and has been a tenured professor of both surgery and internal medicine at uh, USF. Dr. Norman's uh, advanced surgical approaches for parathyroid tumors uh, paralleled the ongoing research for sentinel lymph node uh, surgery for melanoma and breast cancer at uh, Moffitt Cancer Center back in the early 1990s. Dr. Norman's research has been awarded over four million dollars in research grants and uh, has been awarded six separate patents. Dr. Norman has authored over 200 peer-reviewed articles, the vast majority uh, dealing with parathyroid disease. Uh, most recently, Jim has begun the National Parathyroid Education Foundation, a nonprofit organization aimed at uh, educating the public about the dangers of blood calcium. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. James Norman? It, I've been coming to this meeting um, with um, a lot of you for the last uh, 15 years or so, and so it's a, pr a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here talking to you. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of the data today, and a lot of the data in these patients came from your patients. So uh, these little bar graphs, you guys are responsible for making these bar graphs. Um, Arnie Goodman is a, a very valued partner of mine and Doug's, and Arnie is uh, undergoing some very <clears throat> aggressive chemotherapy. He's sick and he can't be here. So we'll keep him in our prayers and I will give Arnie's talk. The database we're gonna talk about here is we've got over 12,000 uh, patients in our database uh, referred from over 1,400 different endocrinologists uh, and all of these patients have surgically proven parathyroid, primary hyperparathyroidism. None of what you're gonna to see today is secondary or renal hyperparathyroidism. Uh, this is all primary hyperparathyroidism. We in our database uh, uh, track 81 different pre and post-operative data points. Um, and from that, we're able to see all sorts of different uh, data for almost any parameter. We can tell you how many 56-year-old women with a calcium of 10.7 were born on a Tuesday and wear uh, size seven shoes. We know all sorts of data that we can query and uh, have come up with some very interesting uh, graphs, which you'll see today. This graph, we're going to talk about the formation of this graph um, piece by piece. There are parts of this that we're going to talk about, parts of this that we're not. We're not going to talk about high calcium malignancy. We're not going to talk about hypoparathyroidism. Um, but we are, thank you. We are going to talk a little bit about vitamin B D deficiency. We're going to talk actually quite a bit about that. We're going to touch on bypass, pay, bypass surgery. But most of, most of this first talk is going to be establishing this blue curve and how you can tell um, patients with primary parathyroidism from people with vitamin D deficiency and those sorts of issues. Most of the graphs you're going to see today, not all, but most of them in all of our talks on our website. So there's an advanced diagnosis page of parathyroid.com, which is intended for people of your caliber. Uh, it's statistical analysis and things with a lot of data. So uh, there's an advanced diagnosis page of the website where you can go see uh, most of the graphs which we're going to show you today. Let's look first at the uh, calcium levels in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. We'll develop a few normograms of their average calcium levels, their high calcium levels. We'll talk about the, no the, the normal calcemic uh, patients, the variability in calcium levels. This is, these first few uh, graphs here are from a publication we have coming out in endocrine practice in the next few months. 
which is the normal grams of 10,000 patients with, this, with surgically proven primary reparathyroidism. And here, this is average serum calcium levels. So in other words, if you take your patients with all their high calcium levels, we add up all the high calcium levels divided by that number. The average of calcium levels, you see it's, an, it's a bell-shaped curve uh, with a, a, a mode of uh, around 10.7, a mean of 10.9. It's a very nice bell-shaped curve. There are some patients over here with normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism. We're going to talk about that later, later and we're going, to, we're going to dissect this graph quite a bit in, in the next uh, hour and a half or so. Now, you guys don't necessarily figure out the, nor the average of all the calciums of your patients. You look, at the, you look at them and then you look over their highest calcium. A lot of times it's the highest calcium level that tends to uh, trigger our next move. And so this is the normal gram of the highest serum calcium in uh, 10,000 patients. And you see that the normal gram here, uh, the average of high is about 11.2. And there are still are some patients who never get high calcium levels. And there are very few people who live on this end of the, of the curve as well. So most of our patients are right in the middle. So if we can dissect this out closely, the average, the average calcium level for people with primary hyperparathyroidism is 10.9. The highest calcium, the average of the highest calcium is 11.4. Median 10.8, mode 10.7. Mode of the highest calcium that we see in these patients, 11.2. A couple of, a couple of times uh, on our slides in the next uh, hour, we're going to talk about differences in age groups. An interesting finding is we, we have a publication in, uh, coming out uh, in 73 teenagers with parathyroid disease. And young people have different parathyroid disease than older people, oh, younger, older like us, of course. Younger people, younger the teens and the young 20s, they don't have subtle parathyroid disease. Their, cal their mean calcium, their, their median, and their mode is statistically higher than patients between 26 and 50 and greater than 50. So the interesting thing here is between 26 and 50 and greater than 50, the numbers are identical. Same if you look at highest calcium. The, the people under age of 25, they do not have subtle parathyroid disease. So if you got somebody who's 16, 15 years old, do you think they might have parathyroid disease? They don't. Parathyroid disease in young people is not subtle. It's very obvious. They present differently too, as we'll talk later. They present differently with more frequently they have headaches, they much more frequently have kidney stones than their older counterparts. But parathyroid disease in younger folks is not subtle. Uh, us older folks, 26 to 50 and greater than 50, identical in, in, in uh, presentation. And this graph simply shows that patients under the age of 25, their parathyroid disease is shifted to the right. Their tumors aren't bigger. In fact, their tumors are actually smaller. They just, our presumption is they have good receptors throughout their bodies and they really have a good reaction to not very high uh, PTH levels. So the summary in calcium levels, calcium represents a Gaussian distribution. The average calcium levels for people with parathyroid tumors is 10.9, the mode is 10.9. The average highest calcium is 11.4. Patients under 25 have significantly higher average and highest calcium levels. After that, we're all the same. So if we look at normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism, it's something that we all consider. We, we're always trying to figure out if we're seeing it or not. It does occur, and you see in our patient population, we've seen it hundreds of times. So if you look at average serum calcium levels, um, in 10,000 patients, there's a whole lot, there's hundreds of patients who, who in fact have calcium levels, their average calcium levels is less than 10.2. So 2.5% of patients in our 10,000 database here, 2.5%, so that's about 250 that we've operated on, have an average calcium of 10.2 or lower. 1.1% have never had a calcium in the tens. 
They're living in the nines. <clears throat> Findings at surgery were identical. In other words, patients with lower or normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism do not have a higher incidence of hyperplasia. And as you'll see later, we don't like the word hyperplasia. It doesn't exist very often. But the findings of surgery are identical, and tumor size and weight is typically less in these people, but they still have the same number of tumors. They still have an adenoma or two, but their tumors are just smaller. Um, osteoporosis is almost, the, almost always the issue. Why these patients, how these patients end up getting to us? Well, the endocrinologist was working up a patient who has normal, normal calcium levels, but their PTHs are high. Why are they pursuing that? Because the patient's got osteoporosis, which is more severe than expected, earlier on set than expected, and, and or resistant to medical therapy as expected. That's almost always how those patients uh, end, ends up in, in our operating room. Now, this is just a teaser. Doug's going to have uh, uh, an entire uh, uh, lecture in 45 minutes on on NIH criteria and the silliness uh, therein, therein lies. But um, this is just a, a, a quick glimpse of what Doug's going to talk about, that the NIH criteria of patients meet criteria for surgery of 11.4 or higher doesn't happen very often. And you got to remember, if you look at our patients, now I'm going to talk about this later, but our patient population, of, the, of our, our total patient population of over 13,000, about 45% of our patients come from Florida and about 65, I'm sorry, it's 45% it's of the patients come from Florida and 55% of our patients come from outside the state of Florida. So you guys are overwhelmingly represented in this graph, which means, of course, that you guys don't buy the NIH criteria any more than we do. Surgical candidates, 85% of patients have average calcium below 11.5, 69% of patients never had a calcium above 11.5, only 9% of a calcium above 12. Doug's going to talk more about that in a few minutes. Variability, calcium levels fluctuate in all patients with parathyroid disease. You and I do not have variable calcium levels. You and I have calcium levels that are very, very constant. Patients with parathyroid disease have calcium levels which are variable as a rule. They can be as high as 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. 74% of the patients that we operate on and take out a parathyroid tumor had at least one normal calcium level in the previous 12 months. So it goes up and down. So when you get a patient who you think has got a parathyroid disease, you check it again, their calcium level went back down to the normal range. That doesn't mean they don't have a parathyroid disease. That means they do. It's variable. That helps you make the diagnosis. 